you back here with the DLD family. Thank you so much, Steffi. Thank you so much, Dr. Burda. And if there's a smart group of people anywhere on the planet from diverse backgrounds that can help engage in this topic, I think it's you. So it's a mad, mad, mad cyber world we live in today. So let's start with a stark reality. It's pretty simple, there's three points. Number one, anything networked can be hacked. Number two, everything is being networked. So number three, everything is vulnerable. We've got five to 10 billion devices connected to the internet today. It'll be tens of billions and soon probably trillions during the young people in this room's lifetime. Trillions of sensors, devices, whether it's in the wine bottles, our shoes, on our dog, everywhere it's gonna be. It's going to be ubiquitous. And with it comes shared vulnerability that we all have. It doesn't mean security is impossible, it just means it's quite difficult. So now how are we going to think about this new world? And if you just remember those 12 worlds, whenever you think about cybersecurity, internet security, you go back to it, you'll have a picture. And there's a reason that this is true, and the reason is that the internet was architected not for security. It was designed for openness and information sharing. And that's what it succeeds at, right? And we all love the internet, and it's spreading because of that. So it was never designed for security. So how are we going to think about this internet? Well, what I want to present for you is a model for you to consider, which is that this is a mad, mad, mad world. There's three mads. The first is nuclear mutual assured destruction. With the invention of atomic weapons at the end of World War II and their tragic use, we came into a new world where mankind has the ability to potentially completely destroy itself. And this led to new global institutions like the United Nations, and it, and it led to risk management globally that we all shared from this common vulnerability. This framework is still with us, and it affects the cyber world that we're living in. It's nuclear mad. The second mad is new, and it's mutual assured disruption, and it's cyber mad. Because today, anywhere in the world, a group of hackers or cyber offense attackers can take a keyboard, and after they've written their codes, written their scripts, developed their exploits, they type on that keyboard, and they can launch an attack. Not just a hacking attack on a computer or a cell phone or a network or a botnet army. They can launch it on nuclear facilities or different targets. This is the new cyber world we're in. And there's multiple nation states today that have the capability on one of these keyboards to create very significant disruption. A little of taste of which we've seen in the last uh, uh, 10 years, but nothing like the capabilities at the present or in the near-term future and what's going to develop. So we're going to have to deal with it. So we have cyber mad. The third mad is internet mad. It's mutual assured dependence. And that's the fact that almost everything we're doing in society now, whether it's shopping, building and designing fabrics, tools, your companies, communicating with each other, is done by the internet. So I'd like to know, is there anyone in the room today, anyone here, that does not have a smartphone or own a smartphone? Is there a single hand in the room? I don't see one, there might be, and diversity is a good thing. But is that a hand there? No, I don't see a hand. So we've all become dependent on the internet, tremendously dependent, and that shapes the world. So these three polar uh, forces are very powerful. Mutual assured destruction, mutual assured disruption, capability through cyber, and the mutual assured dependence we have so we all want to keep the internet running and working so we can have a good life. So let's consider a, a uh, case study uh, out of recent history. How many of you have heard of Stuxnet? Okay, about half of the audience. Stuxnet is one of the most pernicious computer attacks ever developed, or what we call a computer worm. It was designed to infect and interrupt the nuclear centrifuges in use at an Iranian enrichment plant in Iran. Uh, it worked. Uh, it was discovered in 2010, and by the time it was discovered, it had incapacitated over 10% of the centrifuges, some of which had simply failed, some of which blew up. 
Uh, it's an example of someone on a keyboard typing a command, not launching missiles, not sending tanks, not bombing, launching a cyber attack. Extremely sophisticated, and it reflects the mad, mad, mad world. Because Stuxnet was designed for what? To control nuclear weapons, to stop proliferation, which is our risk management tool from the nuclear era. So it was born from the nuclear madness. It reflects cyber madness. It not only was very sophisticated, but in many ways opened up cyber hacking attacks into industrial controllers. It happened to hit the Siemens industrial controller. Uh, and it also reflects internet mad, because once it was discovered, and that was shared publicly, parties then around the world worked together to clean it out of the global system so that it wouldn't cause other problems, because we're all dependent on this system. So we live in this mad, mad, mad world. Now, more things are happening, as I think you well know. So, let's talk about the news du jour. Snowden and trust. I know that German culture, European culture, has very strong values in caring about privacy. So what I want to know is, how do you feel about the Snowden news? How do you feel about the revelations? Or how do you feel about the, the American government's disclosures? Input from the audience. Just give me a word. How do you feel? Oh, was that? Horrible. She feels horrible. How do you feel, Esther? Better informed. Thank you. Over here. How do you feel? Violated. 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 Maybe betrayed. Thank you, Jeff. So there's a lot of powerful emotions that this stirred up. The disclosures that came out, and, and by the way, there's certainly multiple countries engaged in activities. Uh, and without discussing uh, the, the merits of this case or the rights and the wrong, and by the way, in America, there's very divided opinion over this issue. I sense it's less divided in, in Europe, although I'm happy to, to take a quick draw of hands. How many people think what Snowden did was the right thing? Or you support it? Wow. How many of you think that what Snowden did was the wrong thing? Okay. Another group. How many of you are undecided, haven't decided yet, waiting for more information? Okay. In America, it's a little more barbell. There's a lot of people in America who feel that, that national security apparatus is important after 9-11 for other emotional reasons, called trauma. When you're attacked that badly as in 9-11, nations can be traumatized just as humans are. But it's changed the game because now we realize what mad, mad, mad world we live in, as Esther says. We're now better informed. So where to? Where do we want to go with this? Well, one thing is, because the internet wasn't designed for security, what do we need to do now? We have to redesign it, right? So we call that internet hardening, because it was designed for all this information sharing and openness. But if we now restructure the protocols, change the protocols, evolve them, we can make a more secure internet whether it's by using cryptography, many different techniques. And not only does the internet have to be hardened, but security has to be better integrated with the products, the suites, and the technology that's out there. It can be done, and it must be done. And it's going to take a long effort. And you know why we have to do it? We have to do it because if you're afraid of what nation states might be doing with the internet, the hackers, most of us think, the best criminal hacking groups are only two to three years behind the most sophisticated nation states. So whatever you're concerned about that large governments might be doing in different parts of the world, the same capacity can come out of the hacking community. I'm not talking here about the hacktivists. I'm talking about criminal hackers or other groups or even violent uh, uh, hackers. And in this new world, by the way, not only are we vulnerable, but everything is becoming transparent. So governments can watch citizens. And citizens can also watch governments. And that's a mantra we hear from Anonymous. It's a mantra we hear from Chaos Computer Club here in Germany uh, that's very active and uh, around the world. And to the extent their activities are legal, uh, how can one argue with bringing more clarity to what governments are doing? Um, so we have to harden the internet. And that's going to take 
a lot of thinking, and I, wanna, I believe in the Schoendorf model. I like what Joe set up here, which is that the beauty of crowdsourced solutions is you don't know where the genius ideas are going to come from. And these standards are developed by the Internet Engineering Task Force, a global open community, multi-stakeholder community that develops the technology. They're working on this problem, and that group is chaired by a European. W3C, other groups are involved in working as well. Privacy. Who controls what data? And how fortunate am I to speak here in front of my friend uh, and our honored commissioner of the European Commission, Vivian Redding, who's working so hard on data protection laws and guideline and privacy for the European Union and in the global discussion. And I remember a conversation I once had with Vivian, who is such an open leader, asked me, she said, Rod, what's the solution for privacy? What can we really do here? What's your recommendation? You know what I said? I'm not really sure I have the answer. This is a really tough one because the technology works against privacy. The technology promotes transparency, information sharing, which makes policy work for privacy all the more important. So, and I commend her for her willingness to take on these challenges with such a, an open mind. But we've got to figure it out. None of us have figured this out. This is like the nuclear landscape of the 1950s or 60s when everyone was saying, oh my God, we could destroy ourselves. And as ch school children, some of those that are older than the young people in the room used to have to you know, dive under our desks at school in uh, nuclear drills, right? Because we were so panicked about what could happen. We're in those days on the internet. We don't have the solution. We don't have the international agreements. We don't have the technology. We don't have the understanding yet to bring uh, more privacy and more security to the internet. So we've got to we've got to work on it. But since I had the dinner with, with Vivian, at least one idea I had, and, and it's been reflected uh, somehow in some some countries and policies, but is a right to know. I know the French president talked about the right to forget, but the right to know is the concept that you, as an individual or as a citizen, should have a right to know what information a company has about you. Simply the right to demand it. If you can prove who you are and you have the credentials, what is all of the data that that organization has about you? Now, if you had that right, and some people used that right and got the huge data dump, they'd start figuring out how much data is being gathered, and corporate behavior would change, and government behavior would change as well. And there's some rights like this, actually, in the U.S. government, uh, in, in the U.S. side right now. And there are in different places around the world. But I think that's, that's just, but that's one concept out of many. And everyone in this room, and people around the world, creative ideas are needed because we're in those early days. Governance, power, and balance. So the internet as this decentralized network with hyper-transparency is pulling the rugs out on old government structures. Whether it's in, and, and making them stronger. Whether that's in most of the Western world with Twitter and Facebook, all kinds of online uh, communities, or in China with 500 million users, 500 million on Weibo, and tens of millions sharing their view of where politics should go, or saying where the potholes are, or where the corruption is. It's changing the world. It's changing the shift of power. And we have to figure out how to incorporate this. And I think the internet can be an incredible tool for us. And the cybersecurity issues that are bubbling up are challenging government institutions and international collaboration. And that's why the President of the United States spent 40 minutes in a focused address three days ago to discuss this specific issue. And finally, it relates to internet governance, because with the concerns about surveillance, the concerns about what's our privacy, some trust has been lost in the system. As Jeff and others mentioned, people have a sense of betrayal. What we don't want to do is throw out the baby with the bathwater. The reality is the internet governance institutions, and by the way, ICANN is only a, a coordination body for the domain name system and network addresses and unique identifiers uh, that I was involved with. The internet's ecosystem is extremely decentralized, and there's only one part of it that has a, a different tether to the United States government, and that's the I ICANN that Esther was a founding chairman of, uh, and I served as CEO for three years, and it has two contracts with the U.S. government. I signed both of them. I negotiated them with the government when I was running ICANN, and I'm proud we made great progress on the affirmation of commitments with a lot of support from Europe. We didn't make as much progress on IANA, and that con a second contract needs to be evolved in some form to help the internet 
become more truly international and for ICANN to become the independent body it was always conceived of being. But what we don't want to do is hand over that internet coordination to multi multilateral government institutions or national government institutions like the United Nations or individual countries, all of whom would like to grab the internet and try to seize control, I think much to the harm of citizens and, and your companies. So, in summary, it's a mad, mad, mad world we live in. And this, these new dynamics are describing the system, mutual assured destruction we still have, mutual assured disruption through cyber, and mutual assured dependence. And I hope that working together, we can all bring some sanity to this mad, mad, mad world. Thank you.